so nice to see you all again virtually yeah, you're on the last episode of season three of music and chat with Shelly Ong and it's a good morning from me to you in Singapore of course in Singapore and around the world uh, various communities have celebrated Chinese New Year the year of the tiger and like the tiger I wish that oh well I should say uh Let's all mm -hmm, get together and face 2022 with passion and fearlessness. <laughs> anyway, always great to have you at my party on Music and Chat. Uh, please say hi and you know what to do in the live chat and let us know where you're tuning in from and don't be backward in coming forward and remember to put any questions you may have in this live chat here and let us know where you're tuning in from so we may answer them or at least my guest and i will address them as the stream moves along uh, music and chat will be two years old in may and I'm eternally grateful to you for subscribing to my channel. I shall work diligently to find you intriguing guests each and every episode. Uh, please help me pass the word around though. Uh, my wish is that you would, I would dearly love to see 600 subscribers before our second anniversary uh, and I believe I can achieve it with your help so thank you in advance um, please don't be shy again I know there's several several uh, viewers out there I can see that in my virtual bodies 
I have a list right here on my right to tell me how many viewers I have online at the one time and there's several shy people out there don't be shy so anyway, uh, it is 9.36 in Singapore right now and it's a somewhat of a dreary day. It's been raining quite heavily in spurts, I guess. That's just the way it is in um, equatorial type weather, uh, especially around this time. But then the, uh, the Asian community believe that if it rains during Chinese New Year, it's a sign of prosperity so let's hope that it is indeed mm -hmm. prosperous for us in many ways our health and our wealth and our friendships double thumbs up okay uh, i'd like to perform for this last episode a piece called escape which is on my third album crossing paths and uh, I wrote it during a period where I needed to run to a, a place of calm. Uh, I'm sure all of you have had at one time or another experienced this need to get away. And it's been tough for us not being able to uh, run away to a holiday or a vacation somewhere. Uh, due to the pandemic so I'd like to dedicate this piece to all of you out there needing to uh, sprint off somewhere peaceful uh, this piece is called escape and you will uh, realize that it starts calm and a little uh, perhaps a, uh, in a mood to seek a place of calmness and then running off <laughs> in a whirlwind. <laughs> All right, so uh, I shan't turn on my theremin cam because this is a synth piece, but I shall lower my camera so you can see my synth. All right, here we go.
So that was escape, guys. Uh, looks like we have someone else in our live chat. Uh, Anna, uh, let us know where you're tuning in from, and the rest of you shy guys out there, please say hi in the live chat. Okay, let's move on. Uh, the 80s. Mm, some of us remember the 80s because we lived it. Some of us remember the 80s because we were fond of what the 80s gave us. Uh, the 80s was defined in many ways uh, by the end of the Cold War, the rise of computer technology. And boy, did we have an uh, infusion of technology the lingering pool of 80s fashion and music and of course the introduction of midi it was also the beginning of george lucas's mu uh, movie empire with movies such as empire strikes back uh, return of the jedi and et our guest today had a an adventure like no other and uh, when he won the role of Mace Tawani in the Star Wars Expanded Universe featuring the Ewoks. So let us welcome our guest, Eric Walker. I am gonna call him on Skype. Hey, Eric. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, and you? All right, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know you've had a busy day already. Yes, it's now yes. your night. <laughs> yeah, you're ahead of us, right? Well, you're on the other part of the world. Yeah, yeah I am. But... We are so close to the equator, it's not funny. Uh, but you're on the West Coast on, uh, on Pacific time, so I think you're something like... Uh, 15 or 16 hours behind us. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So you're now 5.47 uh, oh. yep. p.m. and we're 9.47 a.m. That's true. My, my wife is from Vietnam, so it's probably the same time zone as you. You know, I need to look it up. Anyone in the uh, v uh, live chat want to look that up? The time difference between Vietnam and Singapore? I'm quite sure Eric's right, but you know, I've never been to Vietnam and I was talking to a relative of mine yesterday. She has never either and we promised each other we would get together and make that visit <laughs> together. Yes, you ha you must go. It's uh, actually in Vietnam, I just looked, it's 8.48, so they're an hour behind mm. yeah. there you go so uh, let's jump right into your part as a mace Hwani, uh, in caravan of courage and ewok adventure and this movie was released uh, 18 months that's for those in the viewing audience who may not know the a little bit of the uh the history of of the series of uh, ewok movies it was uh, released uh, 18 months after return of the jedi uh, and uh, George Lucas's uh, first Star Wars trilogy. And Caravan was set on the moon of Andor and featured the Ewoks who helped two young human siblings locate their parents. And the siblings were you and your sister, Sindel, played by five-year-old Aubrey Miller. I do have a, uh, before we talk about it i do have a picky of the movie poster which i'm displaying um it being a live stream of course we know you might only see the picky 30 to 90 seconds later hopefully sooner than later but sure. uh here's the movie poster and uh in a few seconds i'll even play a short clip of the trailer from the mid 80s uh, I won't play the entire clip because I don't know if I'll get ourselves in trouble, but I'll play a short clip. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so let's do that. Here's the short clip. I'll just grab, I'll just start it somewhere here where you hear a little bit of the intro commentary. Far, far away, a brother and sister search for their missing parents. How are we going to find them? We will. Don't worry. And fate 
leads them to the magical Ewoks. We help you. Now, a... So we help you. There we go. That's that's as far as I think I can take it. <laughs> yeah, don't, yeah. Don't don't uh, yeah. Don't play the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah nice for sure. Don't want to get in trouble. So, uh, Eric, I did some digging up of any information about the movie, and uh, that I found uh, a little paragraph from the Hollywood Reporter. I don't know how trustworthy they are, but they had a little blurb about your audition. And it seems that you're 15 at that time. So you're here to verify whether you're indeed 15. And uh, it seems that you were told to audition, that you were auditioning for an after school special and that the producer would be viewing a videotape of the audition. And you walked in with a monologue that you had prepared from a scene from acting out a stage play about a kid. Wow, you've done your homework. Uh, and <laughs> I was 14, though. The, the, 14. I was a, yeah, but that's the only difference. And and Aubrey Sindel was four. Uh, uh, we were 15. I was 15, and she was five when we did the second movie. Oh, there so, you go. But so yeah. far, you're hitting a, almost 100%, though. Hooray. That, so, and it yeah. seems that 10 minutes after the test, uh, you got the job. <laughs> oh, I well, actually, we did... They, that we had the, the monologue and then like some time had passed and then we did a screen test oh. about a, a week or two later. And then after I did the screen test, they came out 10 minutes later and said oh. we had the job. They, I guess they went in a room and talked about it. And I think they already picked, I think George Lucas had already picked us. Oh. And they oh. did, and I think that the director and the producer just want, they had us do a screen test just to see how we would work together. Oh, so gee, once oh, they gee. once they determined that and saw that we worked well together, that then they guess gave, they gave us the job. Oh, so was the screen test with Aubrey then, or with yes. other? Yes, oh. with Aubrey. Yeah, it was just her and I. Uh, we went up to uh, you know Aubrey lived up in uh, near Santa Rosa, so she was close to there because this was in Mill Valley, which is near San Rafael. It's above San Francisco, and they flew me up there to do the screen test. Uh, the other audition, which I did the monologue for, which George Lucas saw, was a few weeks before that. But, uh, yeah, so when they flew us up there, we got in costume. We did a couple scenes from the movie. They filmed the, the, the scenes we were doing. Mm, uh, Eric, you have frozen. I'm not sure why. I hope you're not still talking. Oh, not my hand. Oh, Are we back? You yes, you're back. Okay. Now it says I've frozen. Yeah, who knows? Uh, I, you know, as many tests as I can make, uh, te technically and all that, uh, you're testing, kind of testing. at the mercy of the live stream, isn't it? Th things always go, go Hello. some other way. <laughs> but yeah, you're back again. I'm sorry. Are we having connection difficulties? Hello, testing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you are back again. I'm gonna try to go back on. I'm gonna try to go. Can you hear us? Mm-hmm. Yes. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I said I was back online again, but then I can't see it. Why don't you try to call me back? Maybe. Uh, all right. Okay. Sorry, folks. Uh, it looks like he's not hearing me. In the middle of the podcast. So I'm calling him again. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Uh, I'll call him again. I'll call him individually. Start call. Are you there? Hello? Yes. I am. Uh, Technology. <laughs> yeah, can you hear me and see me then? Yes, I can All see right. you. Yeah, it was really strange because at one point you froze, and after that, thereafter, I could hear you and, and see you, but you couldn't obviously hear me, even if you saw me. So anyway, that's good. At least I know I can call you back. Uh, I call this the tech gremlins at work. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> When it's live, anything happens, so uh, I think we're quite used to it already. Um, yeah, you were saying, you're talking about uh, the audition, of course. Yeah, yeah, no, and then, yeah, it was it was pretty fast. The whole process was pretty quick. Uh, I 
from the moment that I first auditioned to him to the moment that I actually were on film, filming the movie was a little over a month. Oh right, did they? It was a pretty fast. Process. Do you know? Did you? Uh, d did you ever find out why you were the ideal candidate for the role? Did you? I, I did. Mm. That's a good question. Um, I was. I was never told necessarily why I was chosen. I did. I was told that they did a lot of searching. They, they, they auditioned actors in New York. They auditioned actors in Los Angeles, where I'm from, San Francisco, different cities. And I do know that I came in very late in the process. So I was like, I just they showed up at the, near the end of it, and um, that's all I was told. And I was told that it was for an after-school special, just like the Hollywood Reporter said. All that stuff's true. And uh, I was supposed to just go there for a general interview to see if I was right for the part. I wasn't supposed to even read for them. Oh. And uh, at the, the place where I went was called the Egg Factory. It was a building of offices that Lucasfilm was their headquarters here in Southern California at the time. It's no longer there. They actually tore it down and they built a subway station. And the Egg Factory is like where next to Universal Studios on Lancashire, like right across the street from it. Wow. Did, yeah. Were you in possession of a camera then, and were you allowed to take pictures of your process, or you know? Yeah, <laughs> we did. We had, in fact, I have I have a whole collection that I offer people when I go to conventions. Oh, I, see. I have like a CD that has like my private photographs, oh. and and uh, some people put them online and they use them without my permission. I don't oh. mind if people use them, mm. but I mean, just give me credit, say it's from my collection. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not worried about the copyright or anything like that. But yeah, I, my dad had purchased, after I got the role, he bought a Nikon camera. Mm -hmm. So I actually was taking pictures the entire time, including when they gave me a tour of uh, the miniature shop and over at ILM and just for light magic. So I was oh. taking pictures of all the little miniature Star Wars stuff. And Indy, at the time, they were doing Indiana Jones. So I was taking pictures of that, E.T., because ILM did a special effects for ET and a lot of uh, stuff. In fact, at the time we were making Caravan of Courage, Ron Howard was doing the screen test for Cocoon, the movie oh, Cocoon. Right. And he was there, and I got to meet Ron Howard at the time, and uh, he had a lot of nice things to say to me. And it was like, whoa, it's blowing my mind. I love Ron Howard, you know, because I remembered Happy Days, and it's like, I was surprised he even knew who I was. It was like, really, you know, so. That's cool. So you were a, a fan of Star Wars already when you got the part, I suppose. I was definitely. I would definitely say I was a fan. I wasn't. I did. I was so young. I didn't see the um, the first Star Wars mm. in a the movie theater, and the second one I didn't see either. I was still very young. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, you don't start getting in. Uh, well, for me at least, not everybody's different. Mm -hmm. But I didn't start going to the movies until I was almost a teenager, anyway. Yeah. Maybe yeah. just just who I was. Mm -hmm. So everybody's different. Because I hear stories where kids say they saw Star Wars when they were seven or eight, and I would have been seven or eight when Star Wars came out. But I just wasn't into movies. In fact, when I was seven and eight, I was busy trying to play. I was playing football and baseball at that time. So. It was before I became an actor. In fact, football is why I became an actor, because I did a Jack in the Box commercial oh. on the football team. They they picked our football team to be in this commercial, oh. and that's oh. how I started acting, So, which was an interesting, uh, that's, uh, that's how I jumped into becoming an actor. I was mainly into sports before oh. that. Well, let's talk a bit about that then, before we continue with uh, your role in uh, Caravan. So you were doing commercials, you were acting in the commercials. How many of these commercials were made? Do you recall? The Jack in the Box commercial, we did two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, it was on the football team, and then to, and so they don't have to go out and hire a new team. We played the soccer team too. Oh. And to you guys, football is soccer. Mm -hmm. I'm, but I'm talking about American football, and then we did it one where we're playing soccer too. Okay. Other than that, I probably did about 10 or 15 commercials in my career, not a, a lot. Mm. Um, I, after that, I decided I liked acting, and, uh, and I was really trying to get my dad to let me become an actor. Mm. I go, wow, this is great. You get paid, and they, they let you eat Jack and you know, fast food. You know, I thought that was wonderful. Um, he wasn't so sure I wanted to do it, so he mm. made me ask again and again and again because I was like seven years old at the time. And then about a couple of years after, I kept asking for years, and he said, okay, go ahead. And then around 1980, 
Um, I, I auditioned for an agent. The agent uh, interviewed me. She said she would represent me, and I started about 1980. Um, I didn't get too many parts in the beginning. Then I started act. I started going to acting classes to learn how to become a better actor. Mm. And uh, that acting coach at that time, his name was Virgil Fry, and his daughter was Soleil Moon Fry, who was Punky Brewster. I don't even mm. remember the show Punky Brewster. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, Virgil was a really um, he was a character actor, and he was and he later became my manager, my mentor, my acting coach. Mm -hmm. But he Virgil comes from. His he came from like old school acting. Like his best friend was Dennis Hopper, Marlon Brando. Um, he was good friends with Paul Newman. In fact, uh, if you read uh, Marlon Brando and Paul Newman's book, they mentioned Virgil because they were friends. They were part of the civil rights movement uh, back in the '60s. They were going around and helping Dr. King with the civil rights movement. So this, but for some reason, he just never. He always he was the one person in that group that never became super famous like the rest of them. Um, anyway, he was a great mentor, a great teacher, and after studying with him for about a year or two, I started to get parts. Uh, my one of the first things I did, I did a, a play called um, Mrs. January, Miss, Mrs. January and Mr. X, which was a comedy. It had Beverly Sanders and uh, Dina Dietrichs directed it, and then after that, I. I got a movie with uh, Diane Cannon called Having It All, and uh, where I played her nephew. And um, then I just started getting roles. Like I was on Webster. I don't know if you remember this, mm -hmm. the television show Webster. Mm -hmm. I was on that, and I played Webster's the football player. Speaking of football, my career started because of football. Then I played a football <laughs> player later, kind of. And then I started getting be bigger parts. And then I, right before I got Caravan of Courage. I went to network and I almost was going to do a, a television series and I didn't get it. And right after that, I got Caravan of Courage. So I started to get better roles and I was up that that uh, it was a network show. And coincidentally, that show didn't last for very long. It, it was a movie with Jason Bateman, uh, not a movie, but a television show with him called It's Your Move was the name of the TV series. It only lasted one season. So I didn't get that. But then I got Caravan of Courage. Um, and then, so was there and, a, a was there a valuable lesson that you got from Virgil as your mentor that kind of boded you well throughout the process of, you know, recurring parts that got better and better uh, before you you uh, secured Caravan? Uh, well, the one well when studying with Virgil, he he teaches the old Strasberg technique. Lee Strasberg, okay. he was a very famous okay. acting teacher. So when you're doing a character, like if, for example, if, if you have to cry in a scene, you'll recall a moment, you know, that happened in your own life, like maybe a death of some family member that touched you, like if you have a parent or somebody that died. So you'll think about them when you're doing the scene and it'll help you get that emotion out and help you cry. Um, and most of acting is reacting. And, and they have another thing called the magic of believing. And if you don't believe in what you're talking about in your emotion, Nobody else is going to believe you either, right? So that's uh, I learned a lot from Virgil. Um, he was a very good teacher. Um, I, I he was uh, I guess that was what he he was meant to do, and he wasn't famous like Paul Newman and Marlon Brando and Dennis Hopper, but that was where he was at. And then later his daughter became pretty famous. Um, but um, yeah, I learned a lot from Virgil. Uh, one of the most valuable things he taught me as an actor was that to be be a good actor. We have to break down all the walls that are all around us that we build as we grow up. Because if you have too many walls up, you know you're you're gonna you're not gonna be able to you know become a better actor. If you break down those walls, that help you get to those emotions, help you convey you know that. Not only that, when people that hold stuff inside all the time, they become bitter. Sometimes they get ulcers. Sometimes they get cancer. You know, so letting go is one of the most valuable things even now even though i'm not acting letting go in fact in acting we have when we finish a scene or when we're doing a scene in a movie or whatever we say in cycle end e n d cycle in cycle and that means that it's ended it's we just left it there so that we don't carry it into our normal life and in life whenever you go through stuff 
you got to get past. Uh, you know, you got to learn to forgive, and you got to learn to end cycle and move on. Otherwise, you're not going to grow as a human being. You're not. It, it, this taught me a lot of valuable lessons as a human being as well in regular life. And if anybody's watching, you have to let go of stuff. Otherwise, it's going to later tear apart your life. And it might. You may not think it. You not maybe not believe this, but when people in life are too hung up on things and too anxious and too nervous or or have anger in their heart or whatever they have that leader that later leads to people have ulcers it leads to them like we mentioned before you get diseases you're killing yourself so and that's a very buddhist way of thinking as well too um so and that's that yeah ending stuff and forgetting about it and letting go is the best thing i learned from virgil well there you go viewers out there um that's that's an interesting uh, insight uh, on Sunday morning for us because a lot of us are, I think, going through um, uh, situations where we wish we had more control over. But I think be, trying to be in control somewhat also limits your ability to just let go and go with the flow. Uh, I spoke to a friend recently, and we recall uh, Bruce Lee and his famous "Be Water." Yes. I love that. An, you learned a lot. We learn a lot from Bruce Lee's. Teachers like this teach us a lot of stuff. You're right. Great saying. Yeah, I've been, I have been, and my viewers know this. I try very hard to just be water, but sometimes it's easier said than done, but it has helped me through many situations. So everyone out there, be water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Eric, how was it like working with uh, Aubrey then? Interesting, you know, and this hasn't come out that much. And, and the, you're, you know, having this conversation with you reminds me of what we were doing back then. Mm. And I remember that in the very beginning, she almost, she almost couldn't do the part. Oh. Because she was so young and she got very sick. The begin when the filming started, so she couldn't even be there the whole first week of filming. She wasn't there, so just in case they didn't know how long she was going to be sick, they she had a photo double named Bianca Rose. Oh. They were she was filming all her scenes with me oh. wow. as we were going along, and then later they just went back and picked up and got Aubrey's scenes that she missed. But it was an interesting thing, and it was a you know she was a young kid; she could only work like the l l child labor laws for someone that's uh, under eight or something like that, you could only work two hours a day. Oh. So it was very, oh. so when she was on the set, everybody had to be moving. You had to know what you're doing. They had to get a set up quickly because she just, you're not allowed to work a kid that young. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was an interesting challenge. And it was also interesting to have to do stuff over again uh, because we had to refilm scenes again, but she very, she, and then later she got the second movie and she was a star of it. And she did such a great job in the second movie. I was so proud of her. Um, because the original movie was supposed to be more, more of a Mace and Sindel movie. It was not supposed to be Mace starring in it all the way through. Her, Mace and Sindel were more like brothers and sisters and more like equals in the first movie. But because she was so young, a lot of it had to be on the set had to be changed and I got more lines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If you read the original script, you'll see this because it's, it, you know, uh, and I have a copy of the original script, by the way. I'm, I'm letting fans have the opportunity to get it as well. Uh, um, but uh, the movie changed a lot because of the age issue. Other than that, she was just a very pleasant person. Her parents were wonderful people. She grew up, went to college. She got a degree in uh, production, believe it or not. Mm. And mm. the last time her and I were chatting, uh, she's like producing and editing like uh, for TV commercials. When she was in college, she was doing it for a local news station. She would go on the scene and do local news and stuff like that. But now she's just uh, she works for some company up in Santa Rosa and she's just producing and editing uh, uh, commercials and stuff like that. So she, she's still in the business, but behind the scenes. That's cool. So did, do you have any siblings of your own? I have a one, I have two sisters and one brother. One of them's a half sister. The other one's, because uh, my dad got remarried. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, uh, I w growing up, I was the baby, oh. but later my dad 
remarried. Now I have a younger sister. So you had、um, no trouble relating to Aubrey as a sibling then. It was, it was my chance to be the bigger brother、oh, because I was like the baby.、Uh-huh. So it was it was a, it was it was a great it was it was like oh great I finally <laughs> get to be the old child. So, but. They come from. She comes from great. Her parents are great people.、Uh, her parents,、uh, her dad David and her her mother Rhonda, very good people. So, so I have some pictures.、Um, of course,、uh, I found. Oh, these are from you, Eric. Uh, the uh, two of them. So、uh, two scenes. Where was I? To, uh, I believe these are still the caravan movie rather than battle. Right. The two that、okay. you sent me、uh, that should be displayed now. In the okay. Live stream.、Mm-hmm. So were they just uh, uh, which which uh, pictures are? Well, with, with, one is of well, you in your you know your orange jumpsuit holding、okay. a weapon. And the other、oh, yeah. is with you and Aubrey, somewhat on your shoulder, and the two Ewoks on either side of you. Yeah, yeah, that's、uh, the that one with us was Aubrey and me and the two Ewoks. That's a promotional photograph、mm-hmm. that was taken for promotional purposes.、Mm-hmm. Um, that wasn't actually from a scene in the movie.、Oh, okay. And the、uh, the scene where I'm holding the blaster is a scene in the movie. It's where I'm trying to protect Sindel when the Ewoks、oh. first first come aboard. So.、Okay. And、uh, I believe this movie was directed by John Corti. How、uh, yes? How was it like working with him? John Corti, a、uh, very very good director.、Um, I've worked with a lot of good directors in my time. He、mm. was very sensitive to children. He was、mm. very good with with us as kids.、Mm-hmm. I'm sure、mm. it was very difficult for him because <laughs> we were kids, and at that time I was a teenager.、Mm-hmm. And Warwick Davis, who played Wicket. I mean, he walked as a teenager too, so they had to deal with us as kids while running around.、Um, but John Cordy is—I would call him—he's what we call an actor's director,、uh-huh. and an actor's、mm-hmm. director is a director that knows something about acting. So、mm-hmm. a lot of times, an actor's director may have even studied acting, like we were talking about earlier.、Mm-hmm. So they know how to—they know how to talk to an actor more about how to get to an emotion in the scene, or it's—they it, are able to—they know our lingo more.、Um, Sometimes, sometimes the actor, an actor director, also might have been an actor as well.、Um, a technical director is more like George Lucas, and George Lucas actually did direct all the reshoots when we were making the movie.、Mm-hmm. So I got to work with him for about ten days as well. But I, I can't say enough about John Cordy. A very, very kind man,、um, very sensitive.、Um, he directed a lot of、uh, really good. He's been, he's been, he's won an Academy Award for directing. So.、Mm-hmm. He did. He did a dot,、uh, something called、uh, Mrs.、Uh, the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. He did that. He did Where Are the Devolts and Their Children. I think he won an Academy Award for that.、Um, so he, he's been around for a while. He's worked with a lot of big talent. If you look him up,、mm-hmm. John Cordy.、Yeah, mm-hmm. so. so I did find a picture of you. Uh, uh, I. You look like you're having a conversation with George Lucas and somebody else, and I don't know who this somebody else is. But the picture should be displayed in a few seconds, and I'm I not. Think, I think I think I might be talking to John and Tom. I think they're both on. John is on. John, if it's a picture, I'm thinking of John is in a, a white kind of jumps,、uh, not a like a beige.、Uh, this is a black shirt with a baseball cap. And George Lucas is on the left in the picture. Okay, the person on the right, I think, is John Cordy, actually,、right. if I remember correctly. And that was when we were doing,、uh, we were on Skywalker Ranch when that picture was taken. We just、oh. were filming a scene called called the Magic Pond scene. It's where a mace gets trapped underneath this pond,、okay. and he can't get out. And Wicked has to help him with his magic stick. So that's that would have been when we fi- were filming that scene. So George how- was. He was visiting the set at that time. Oh, so how was it like for a teenager such as you to work, to go between an actor's director and a technical director? Because as you said, George Lucas took over some of the pickup shots later on. With you in it, I suppose these shots were. So how could, you, how did you find yourself adapting easily or not? Because you were still relatively young to the. 
the the job it was of a, acting. It was a learning experience for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a technical director moves at a faster pace because mm -hmm. they're. And, and we, even when I was working with George Lucas, mm -hmm. you know, I could sense he was editing it as he was shooting it. Mm -hmm. I could tell he was in his mind, and he would be move, He'd set up a shot much faster than John Cordy. Mm -hmm. And he would film it, and the whole pace of the set was a lot faster when he was directing. So mm -hmm. it was actually easier to work with John Cordy mm -hmm. than it was for George. But George was faster at what he what he did because he's a he's a he's a photographer and an editor at heart. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, before he became a director, he was uh, doing camera work with Francis Ford Coppola, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and he was good friends with him. And and actually, John Cordy and was part of that too because uh the reason why probably george used john is because he was an old friend and john cordy is the reason why francis coppola and and george moved it started moved up to northern california and started american zoliotrope he's the reason behind that if you go back and read the books you'll you'll know that mm -hmm. they mention it but yeah it's harder to work with george lucas not because he's harder to work with, but because you have to be more on top of yourself, um, more on top of your toes. I remember he had actually, one of the scenes we were filming in one morning, uh, they didn't have, he rewrote the scene and, and he handed oh. it to me in his handwriting. And I had to, and I had like 10 more lines and I had to learn it that morning. It was like, oh wow, I better, and you want to impress George Lucas. So I'm trying as best as I can to learn the lines as quick as I can. And then after I was done, I threw it away. Stupid me, right? I wish I, I would have had notes with George writing lines from a scene in the movie. I mean, who would have thought of that? So um, you don't think about keeping stuff like that. Although I did keep a, a call sheet that says George Lucas directed on it, uh, oh. which, which is a, like a prized possession I have. Mm -hmm. So you learned at a very young age what you needed to do to maintain your career then. A lot of people don't get to understand what uh, working in the real world is about. But for people such as us in the creative industry, when we are working, even as a teenager, we are actually, we, we are doing, we have to do a professional job. And that means being on time, being responsible, working hard and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's a business. It's a business. And that's what people forget. Mm -hmm. Just like any job. It's a job and it's mm -hmm. a business. And yet, in fact, Virgil's going back to what things he taught me. He, every once in a while, he would have a class just to give people, a, a, you know, he called it the business of acting. Mm -hmm. And that class, all he taught people was how to become a successful actor in show business because mm -hmm. it's called show business, but people forget the business part. Yeah. The, the other people don't, but as, a, as people watching it, they don't realize it, but it is a business. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh... It's interesting talking to some of my entertainment industry f friends such as you uh, who have uh, people outside the industry not understanding that when you're working, you're, act you're working, it's not fun and games. To them, it looks fun and game. Like it's, you know, this is such a glamorous life. You just roll up and, you know, and then you go home, but they forget the long hours that we put in and all the other responsibilities that we have. Uh, right. Because it's our job. <laughs> so um, I have a poster of uh, The Battle for Andor, which was a sequel to the Caravan. And uh, this one, though, was directed by Jim and Ken Wheat, as far as yes. I know. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are better known for their horror films, such as A Nightmare on Elm Street for Jim and... Well, I they also also uh, create wrote and created all the Riddick series with oh, Ben Diesel. Well, there you go. So, yeah, so they're responsible for that. So how 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 was that directing different from John and George's? Um, it was different because it was two two it was two of them because mm -hmm. they're directing mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. How does that work? It, 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 well, one of them. Is kind of talking to the actor and the other one's dealing with the crew so they were good oh, about that they okay. weren't like tag teaming okay. Um, okay so one of them would speak to us as an actor and the other one would deal with the shots and the lighting and stuff like that i guess it helped them for sure mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. nice guys um they set me down and explained to me a little bit about what why 
this wasn't a family movie and it became a Sindel type movie because that mm-hmm. was there was a lot of controversy after the movie came out. Oh, the critics yeah. slammed the second movie because you know why do you spend this entire movie setting up this family, saving the family, then you kill everybody in the next one, mm-hmm. and it all came down to. Again, these movies were made because, uh, at first, they were made because George Lucas's daughter, Amanda Lucas, at the time, loved Ewoks. So he wanted to continue the Ewoks in some stories because his daughter loved them. And uh, she was the same age as Sindel, so she was the same age as Aubrey Miller. So they, the weekend before they started writing, getting ready to do, write the script for the second movie, because uh, we were assigned to do three movies. Oh, we, we were cool. really supposed to do a trilogy. And uh, that was where that was where George's head, head was. He, did, he signed me to do two more movies. Um, they watched, him and his daughter was watching the movie Heidi with Shirley Temple about the orphan. And after seeing that, he had the idea, why don't we make Sindel an orphan? <laughs> it, had they not watched that movie the weekend before they started the writing session, it might have been a different movie. And also, mm-hmm. one of the brothers said something like, had George Lucas's daughter not been, you know, Aubrey was her hero. Sindel was her hero. Mm-hmm. If, if, if she had been a teenager, you know, maybe it would have been more of a Mace movie. Didn't matter to me. I was happy to be a part of it. Uh, originally, I was told by Aubrey Miller's parents that I was not even going to be in it. I was killed off. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the fact that they at least let me come and do a scene, I was happy to do it because it was very... Very devastating as a young kid to be told your character bites the dust and you're the star of a movie now you're not. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I got as time progressed and I heard stories about how it happened. It made more sense. And George was like that. Like the Wheat Brothers, for example, he had he had seen some movie that they directed, and he loved it and said, "I well, he wanted to work with them because of it." Mm-hmm. And that's how George was. If something. And an idea presented itself that he loved, he did it right away. That's mm-hmm. how how he did stuff, you know. Um, in Star Wars in general, just like this, what happened in this movie, it was made up as they went along. It wasn't really thought out very well. Um, now, Lucasfilm has this storybook group, right? And they have uh, this the keeper of the holocron who, uh, you know, everybody goes to and everything has this book. They have like this Bible they go by, which is great now because uh, now it can be more cohesive uh, as, this, as opposed to just making it up as you go along, which is why there's a lot of plot holes in Star with original Star Wars versus now. And, and you hear all the fans getting upset about this and upset about that. Well, it's because it was just an idea George had and it just kept building and growing and growing. That's why. I guess at that time he didn't realize that it would become a cult uh, phenomenon of sorts. So, you know... Uh, it's gone past that. It's, yeah. it's uh, forgot what they call it, but there's a phrase for it when it becomes oh, part is. of... It's past that. It's like, it's um, Star Wars, it's, it's not just a cult thing. It's like, I don't know what it's called. There's a phrase in it. And I, and I, was, I was talking to someone about that the other day. Right. But it's it's kind of become mainstream. It's 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 beyond that. It's like part of our life and it's mm. part of our culture. There's even people trying to start religions now for yeah. Jedi. And it's like oh, it's, I see what you're saying. I suppose what I was trying to say was he didn't realize how big it would be at that time. As you're saying now, right. there is now there's there's a Bible to follow, or you know, which lays out uh, all the different things that have happened, or the things that can be done, or rules and regulations right. and laws and so on and so forth. So n- now there is a proper kingdom. <laughs> That yeah. exists, but uh, as you're trying to describe to us in in the very beginning, <laughs> you oh, just made and, it and up. <laughs> you're exactly right because when we were making Caravan of Courage, I remember, and I tell this story. I've told it a few times, but the Lucasfilm's publicist, their publicist, was there on the set, mm-hmm. and she was saying she was like amongst telling me, Eric, I'm going to make you very famous, and it's because she's a publicist, <laughs> and I'm going to make it. I'm going to get you in all those magazines, so all the girls love you and i'm a teenager thinking geez i hope all the girls like me <laughs> right <laughs> but um yeah she was saying you're gonna be famous you know how long you're gonna be famous this is part of star wars and i said 
I don't know, probably a couple of years, maybe two or three years, five years at the most. And, and she said, Eric, you're going to be famous for at least eight or ten years. <laughs> eight or ten years. That's you a- and I are talking about this movie I made 37 years ago. So <laughs> they didn't even, you're right, they didn't even know it. They thought it might go on for another eight or ten years and they'd be done with it. <laughs> so. That's just crazy. So, um, uh, uh, you you mentioned earlier that you worked with uh, Warwick Davis and, of course, all the yeah. other actors who were Ewoks. Uh, mm-hmm. Are you still in touch with them? How and how was it like working with them? Well, I mean, I'm still in touch with a few of them through and through Facebook. That's helped out. Yeah. Um, and I, you'll see some of them at, on the conventions. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I just uh, saw Kevin Thompson who played in the, he did one of the Ewoks. Like, the, he was the Ewok that died in the movie, oh. actually, like the woodsman. Okay. And, um, you know, you get in touch with a few of them here or there and stuff like that. Warwick Davis, um, you know, he's too busy to be in touch with anybody. So um, occasionally we'll email each other and stuff like that. But I haven't uh, really seen Warwick for a long time. Um, I want to say, I don't think I, he and I have seen each other since pro- almost 20 years now. It's been a while. But Aubrey and I saw each other at a convention. Even that's been a while because she doesn't want to go out and do conventions. But we've been in more touch than Warwick and I. Um, but, you know, I like to stay in touch with everybody as much as I can. Um uh, I think work work and I will probably see each other at a few conventions coming up here because they move they put these movies on Disney Plus now so uh, there's more interest uh, in them so we'll probably run across each other's paths more often yeah. in the next couple of years yeah. probably. That'll be fun. So um, yeah. more questions about how the movies were shot. Uh, were there particular locations or was it all done in a studio? I would say probably most of it was location, maybe 20 to 30 percent of it was in the studio. Uh, they filmed filmed it at Skywalker Ranch, which is uh, up in uh, north of San Rafael. Uh, there was another uh, place where they have these where they had the redwood forest, and that's and that's called Roy's Roy's R O Y Roy's Redwood Preserve. They shot it there, and that's a oh. place you can go hike, and it's open to the public. So if you look up Roy's Redwood Preserve, you could go and hike there. But a lot of it was shot there. Um, San Jeromo Archery Range, a lot of it was shot there as well. The Battle for Endor lot was shot there. Um, We shot some of the desert scenes and where we're at the Gorax Castle. That was shot in a rock, like a rock quarry in San Rafael. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. So that was another location. But it was all within that area. It was all within... A 30 mile radius it was all shot in the same area and uh <clears throat> i'm sure you did a lot of green screen stuff these days you know blue, we have new technology blue, but back yeah. then sorry yeah. eric back then it's okay back then it was all blue screen they didn't oh, they didn't blue. do things on green screen um and that was at ilm industrial oh, light magic okay. and at that time it was industrial light magic was in san rafael on kerner avenue mm-hmm. uh, and they had they had a main stage, and then they had a smaller stage called Cookie Bay, and then they had the island main stage. And in the island main stage, they had the largest blue screen in the world there. That's right. in, that was indoors. Right. Um, now I think they moved. All, I think Lucasfilm and ILM they moved to San Francisco. They're at the Presidio now. So, right. did you have to do a lot of acting to objects representing CG characters? There were not CG characters back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't have CGI, so but they had the that, but they used the blue screen, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. like the Gorax, who's taller and bigger than us, uh, mm-hmm. that's the, you know they'd block off a shot and the camera would only photograph us and then the blue screen, mm-hmm. uh, and that's what they used. And they also used matte paintings as well, mm-hmm. a lot of matte paintings, um, and they used stop motion photography as well mm-hmm. a lot. Back then, that was the. In fact, the Ewok movies were the last of that, mm-hmm. and then they went into CGI stuff after that. Um, but yeah, it, wow. it was it was very difficult <laughs> pretending like something's there. Mm-hmm. We didn't yeah. have it easy like they do now. Like on on the Mandalorian mm-hmm. and on the Book of Boba Fett, now they have these 
it's not blue or green screen. They actually have these LED screens. Yeah. You know what? So you feel like you're in that on that planet. And even when you're inside a starship or a starfighter, the stars are moving around behind you, and it feels like you're moving, and it's like it's like you're in the real world. So it's like some of it's make believe, of course, because you got to get past that you're on a soundstage. But it's a lot easier than just pretending like, oh, it's right there in front of you, but nothing's、mm-hmm. in front of you. I guess it's easier for the actor and the camera crew as well, and the director for everybody. Yes, they have. They de- filmmaking's come a long ways. Not that it's still not hard work. It is, but it's easier than. And back to the magic of believing. We we're talking about how you got to believe who you are, where you're at. Yeah.、Uh, you have to have more of that back then, for sure. So. How would you say the part of Mace Tawani has affected or affected your career thereafter? I know you stopped acting, so to speak, in the early two thousands, two thousand and two or something. But post Mace Tawani, how how did that role affect you, or did it not till much later? Well, at the time that I was doing those movies,、um, I had this like really it was real strange because I did this movie and then I had this. Period of time for a year, a few years, I didn't work,、mm. and I think it had to do with the representation I had at the time.、Mm. They didn't really quite know what to do、mm-hmm. with or how to promote me coming out of such a big thing like that because I kind of stopped working. Then once I left them, I started working again immediately. So it was、mm-hmm. like I'm not blaming them because they were a new agent at the time, and I stuck with them because I'm. I had a contract and I'm loyal and I love them to death. They're like family members, so I'm not gonna say anything bad about them. But、um, I don't think it affected my career too much because,、uh, again, I had to fight for everything I got after that. I I, I started working.、Uh, I let's see, what did I do after the Ewok movies? I played Robert Downey Jr.'s brother in Less Than Zero. After that,、uh, and I auditioned for that. I Was in a Disney. Speaking of Disney, you know, Disney bought Lucasfilm, but I did a Disney movie of the week, week with Mickey Rooney.、Mm-hmm. After that, I, I was on the new Leave It to Beaver television show series.、Mm-hmm. I was on a, 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 a like a mid-season replacement series. It didn't last very long, but it's called The Marshall Chronicles. I did that,、mm-hmm. and、mm-hmm. then I did a part、uh, in a movie called And You Thought Your Parents Were Weird. I played one of the bad guys,、right. uh, and uh, yeah, no, I just. I wasn't acting as much, but、uh, you know,、mm-hmm. it's just the way the career goes. It's just、uh, it has its ups and downs, like anything. Absolutely.、Uh, speaking of the way things、uh, have changed, thanks to technology and and people's、uh, wishes of fashion,、uh, fashionable fads and things like that,、um, how how do you think acting has changed in the last few decades? Because it's changed a lot. In the music industry, even、uh, even though、uh, the music industry adopted computer-based recording in the mid '80s,、uh, so、right. around that that period of time,、uh, but it certainly forced all of us in in that particular industry to adopt、uh, certain practices,、uh, kind of uh, adopt uh, modifications、uh, to one's skills and.、Uh, The upgrading of one's skills in order to continue being in that industry, sometimes taking on other types of work just to subsist in that industry. How do you think uh, the the uh, acting or film industry has changed in the last few decades for the actor? Well, I mean, it's it it depends on what you're talking about.、If、you're talking about the way the industry is run. It's very different now. A lot of it's run by a lot of people. Actors have managers now,、mm-hmm. as opposed to agents,、oh. and they just go through managers a lot now. And、uh, recently, the way auditioning, the auditioning process goes, it's gotten a lot worse. Doing the managers and all this stuff, it's where it used to be. You know, and、uh, your agent got to, they kind of knew the casting director, and it was like a family, a town. Everybody knew each other.、Mm-hmm. In fact, at one point. I think the last couple of jobs I did, I didn't even audition for them. The casting director、mm-hmm. knew who I was, and just、mm-hmm. offered me the part.、Mm-hmm. Um, or I would come in right at the last call that I wouldn't have to do a first audition. I didn't. I didn't do callbacks 
I wasn't doing all these auditions. I'd come in right at the last call, and mm-hmm. when it was up against me and one or two or three, two or three other people, mm-hmm. uh, and I just would do one audition, and then I'd get the role or didn't get it. So that's mm-hmm. all changed, uh, and a lot of a lot of they you, they have a lot of submissions now. So they'll send you the stuff, and then they expect you to perform, and then send it send it in, and then they view it and see if they like you, and that that creates more a lot, a lot they're getting a lot more submissions so it's become a harder business to get into so uh it's it wasn't an easy business back then when i was in it mm-hmm. but now because i talk to friends that are still in it it's a lot harder now to, to make it in show business than it was um the, also the industry um i know it, this was sort of starting to happen a little bit before i got out of it mm-hmm. but you had to become a triple threat it wasn't just, uh, you know, you're going to be an actor. You also need to learn how to play a musical instrument. Mm-hmm. You probably need to learn how to sing. In fact, that's what sparked me getting into music because I had to learn. I wanted to be more of a triple threat. I wanted to learn how to play an instrument. I wanted to learn how to sing. I found out later I have a nice speaking voice, but you don't want me to sing. You know? <laughs> uh, if you want me to do a narration or something like that, and that's another thing. Taking mm-hmm. vocal lessons, it gave me a better speaking voice. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. And I and I studied, and that got. But now, after that, my passion went into something else. Now I'm in, mainly a musician. I compose music, and that's where my heart is. That's what I'd love to do full time. I wouldn't even mind composing uh, music for movies as well. Mm-hmm. I think my music lends to that because it's very atmospheric and it helps people, you know, travel and get away from whatever they're thinking about now mm-hmm. um yeah, but that's, yeah that uh, yeah yeah that's how eric and i met i think uh because of music i don't quite recall when it was <laughs> but it's i okay. never i never knew of your acting background uh until i saw a post of yours recently and i thought oh well i better have eric on then <laughs> my life yeah that's right yeah, that's right. We met through a musical side because yeah. of your music. Oh, yeah. Um, speaking of, uh, you, you have another uh, side activity that's just as interesting and very relevant to your acting past. Uh, you co-host a podcast with your friend, uh, I believe his name's Kevin Richard. Did I get No, Cap- Captain, Captain Richard. Richard. It was a little hard Captain to tell Richard. from... Yeah. Uh, the uh, little clip that you sent me. I, I first thought it might be Captain, but uh, thereafter no, I that, thought that, perhaps... Because he's, com- he's the comic book genius. Oh, he's right. in a comic book in Captain America. That's, oh, so we nicknamed him because he likes Captain America. His name is Rick, so we call him Captain Rickster. Oh, so Captain Rickster. It, it, yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> but you so co-host a podcast uh, called yes. All for Sci-Fi. And uh, yes. those of you who are viewing and are interested, uh, I have a link to his channel in the blurb part of the live stream video. Uh, and you can also find them on YouTube if you just type in one word, all for sci-fi. And uh, part of your activities include visiting Comic-Cons around the world. Uh, we had our guest, uh, Lee Stringer, recently, who was a part of the London Film and Comic-Con in november last year but you and uh captain rickster did a little uh, video tour of the la comic-con uh, and i did take a clip of your one hour video walkthrough uh, which i'd like to show everyone if that's okay sure. so this is a clip guys so i edited various scenes in it to make like a two minute clip so here we go Perfect. streaming from la comic-con 2021. I'm Eric Walker. I'm Captain Rickster. Let's go look at some sideshow. Here we go, guys. Evil Gremlin is only 200 bucks. Taskmaster, everybody's favorite from Jedi. This lady's got really nice artwork. I can't say anyone's ever ripped one, and it's not a stinky one. That is amazing. How are you, BD1? Good. <laughs> Love you in the game. I don't think tomorrow. I don't think tomorrow is here. 
Who are the two stepsisters? But Ming Na Wen and, and uh, Giancarlo uh, Esposito is here from The Mandalorian. Shore Trooper. We just saw the Shore Trooper. Wow, Walking Dead stuff. Thank you so much for being here on the first ever panel at LA Comic Con on NFTs. Winona forever, awesome. I will tell you this year, it is a little more low key. There are less exhibitors here this year, yes. So um, for those of us who have never been to a Comic-Con and are perhaps new to the concept of a Comic-Con, how would you describe such a convention, Eric? Oh, well, the nerd in me wants to go to these every, every weekend if I could. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's just, it's just, it's uh, L.A. Comic Con, for example. It's, it was, uh, it was a little more low key this year, but all the cosplay is what I love to go to comic cons for because they're all dressed in. Some of them are very unique the way they're dressed, and sometimes they create their own characters based on another character, um, and that's all. That all that stuff's very fun, um, and. Um, yeah, I mean, and that's what I want to do with All for Sci-Fi. That's because not everybody could afford to go to a Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Are there in different parts of the world where you're not? So I just, that's one of the reasons why I started the channel, that and to do reviews of stuff for sci-fi. Because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I'm a nerd and a geek, and I like sci-fi stuff, like Star Wars, Star Trek, mm -hmm. everything sci-fi. And um, what, what I was searching. Mean? Oh, go uh -huh. on, please okay. continue. You well, I was, the reason why I started was because there's always everybody always does something that has their own their own niche like it's always a star trek podcast or a star wars podcast or a lord of the rings podcast or whatever mm -hmm. but i don't see somebody just covering all of one genre so i said why not i love all the sci-fi and i go wait a minute that's a great name all for sci-fi i love all sci-fi so that's why we started but what was your question about the was it about the oh, comic-con yeah i was kind of curious and off because i know because i'm a sci-fi nerd as well uh what makes it so alluring these conventions for fans of sci-fi why would they travel around the world or you know from one part of the world to another just to be there and to cosplay as well it's the atmosphere it's the 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 you feel like the the like your family, like you're belonging to ah, something. Yeah. And that's what, why people do. And sometimes people don't have, they're not that close to their own family. Sometimes mm. mothers and daughters or fathers and sons don't talk and they're fighting, but mm. we're all brothers and sisters that like, and we all like the same thing. It's, mm. it's also being familiar. We're all love what we're doing. So that's why. And uh, a lot of times you get to meet your, your stars too. Like, I mentioned Ming-Na Wen from The Mandalorian, and um, the other gentleman as well from The Mandalorian was there. Jim so you get Carl. to meet stars. Yeah. And Did you get a, a chance times, to meet any of these people during the LA Comic Con? I, they were. They, it was. They were too busy during mm -hmm. that panel. A lot of times, I try to interview them, mm -hmm. but they were just too busy for me to deal with it. Then COVID restrictions were not allowing at this time. But oh. a lot of times when I go there, I like to interview the stars as well. Mm. If you go back and look at older versions of the Comic-Con, like you go back and look at the one I did in 2019, mm. you'll see like I interviewed the Incredible Hulk, Lou Ferrigno, mm. and stuff oh, like the that. So I, yes. The original so I, Incredible Hulk. Yeah, and on the channel, you'll see I'm interviewing Star Wars stars too. Like there's a gentleman who played in a lot of Star Wars stuff. Is He played Nine Numb and... All of Star Wars, his name is Mike Quinn. He's a good friend of mine, but I interviewed him. Mm -hmm. And it's about interviewing and bringing that content. But that's why they go to that, so they can meet them, mm -hmm. tell them stories about what it meant to them. That's why I do that the, the Comic-Cons, because I like to meet fans, too. Just It's not mm -hmm. about just, I don't do it for the money. Mm -hmm. I'm, some people do, but I do it. Because a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just take my expenses and I donate the rest to charity. I'm not even Aww. keeping the money I make at those things. Because yeah. that's not what it's about. I like to hear those stories and and uh, meet people. 
And uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why I love doing it. It's you were, ta- you were saying someone's going to be on your show for the London Film and Comic Con. I'm going to be at the London Film and Comic Con as an actor from mm-hmm. Star- Caravan of Courage, but I'm oh, also going for, cool. for sci-fi. Yeah. So we'll do a walkthrough video. So that's going to be there. Uh, it's, uh, it's in July. The next one's in July. So I'll be, if you go to our channel, All for Sci-Fi, you'll see that uh, in July we'll be there. I'll be in Germany in June at another convention. So Ooh. it's just about that. Plus, I got a new album coming out. So there you go, music. everyone. So, Eric, I have two questions to the end of the live stream. Uh, one, yeah. of course, is to do with the LA Comic Con. How do you think the pandemic has affected it? Because this is a, a social gathering event in that, you know, you're there, as you said, a like-minded family uh, members mm-hmm. from different parents <laughs> coming together to share the love sure. of sci-fi. Um, right. And as we saw the footage, uh, you know, my, I, my, I, my heart went out to the people who were there because there was, you know, you, you had to social distance. There weren't that many people. And yet the attempt was being made to... To, to draw the crowd in and to put on the best convention that they could for that year. Yeah, um, it was down. Um, they sent a they sent an email. It wasn't as down as I thought it was oh, yeah. overall, but I think they said it was down like around, but it was still significant. It was mm-hmm. like around twenty seven or thirty something percent down, which is a lot. Wow. Yeah. But but a convention that this size is at the mm-hmm. LA Convention Center. I think uh, normally they would have a little over 100-something thousand. I think they had like 60 or 70,000 people mm. over a three-day period. But, yeah, it did affect it. Um, so it probably – and I spoke to a couple vendors that were there. They said, we're doing, we're doing okay. We made money even, but it wasn't a slam dunk. So unless mm. it turns around, they said they weren't going to do it the next time. They'll do it. They'll try it one more time, they said. But uh, wow. And I'm sure it will come around. I mean, LA Comic Con, it's it's one of the bigger ones, so I'm sure it'll come around. Yeah. We just got to get past COVID. It That's right. Yes, I agree with you. And our final question for you, uh, do you think you'll go ever get back to acting at all? Uh, I. It's a funny that you brought that up. Um, I actually have an agent uh, now, oh. so it looks Ooh. like I might be doing some stuff. I can't talk about too much of it. But uh, the, the, the goal is to maybe do a few things here. I'm not going to, I don't want to, I'm not trying to pull all the way in, but I would like to do a few things for a couple of years and mm-hmm. then try it and see how it goes. So. Thanks, Eric. Well, it's been really wonderful having you on our live stream and we've totally and utterly enjoyed your stories and having you with us as well. I hope you had fun as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, you know, speaking of uh, potential acting uh, possibilities, we wish you exciting projects ahead. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure everyone uh, currently in the viewing audience and uh, viewing audiences to come post live stream uh, would like to say thank you to you and uh, wish you all the best too. So Eric, it's been my pleasure. Uh, Please stay in touch and please stay safe. Thank you. Yes, you too. Everybody out there, stay safe. It was a pleasure to be on your show. And uh, hopefully we'll just, uh, well, let's get you up to a thousand subscribers. Thank you. And uh, perhaps one day when I'm in LA, I will come uh, visit with you as well. That would be wonderful. (laughs) Uh, You do music, I do music. So we got something in common. There you go. Okay. Thanks, Eric. I'm going to bid you goodbye and take care. Have a good rest of the evening. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. So, everybody, uh, that was Eric Walker, uh, better known as Maze Tawani in the Ewok Adventure uh, movies. <laughs> it's uh, This pandemic has affected us all in so many ways. We, well, at least I, I never imagined it wouldn't. And, you know, I am quite quite, uh, how would you say, adept at using technology in my work. Anyway, I travel, I've been traveling quite substantially until a pandemic. So uh, technology has been very useful in 
getting the work done and keeping the work scene alive. But but still, uh, the pandemic has certainly affected a lot of businesses in the industry. Hence, uh, the type of work has changed a lot, and the uh, the amount of work has changed a lot, and uh, and some work has been halted hopefully momentarily uh, as you guys know i'll be doing my trek back to nashville uh, in a couple of weeks uh, i'm considering doing video shots on youtube of my travels uh, i will let you know you probably will know you'll be notified if you subscribe to my channel so i will upload or live stream as i go along hopefully i won't get in trouble uh, along the way for filming <laughs> areas or or scenes that are you know uh, prohibited from being shown publicly so uh wish me luck and keep an eye out for my video shots as they call it on youtube so the little short video segments so that you won't miss uh, music and chat too much you still see me and hear me and uh, observe my movements from singapore all the way to nashville i will then uh, re uh revitalize or uh music and chat season four in nashville i've got a series of guests that i am about to confirm so that will be very exciting please assist me in uh, upping my subscriber numbers i'm really hoping that by our second anniversary in may uh, we will have 600 or as eric uh, mentioned earlier on that I will hit the thousand very soon. Uh, my subscriber numbers are grown organically by people such as you who visit music and chat and thereafter enjoy the live stream and thereafter hit subscribe. So uh, p please um, pass the word around to your friends so that they may subscribe to the channel and also attend our live streams. Uh, I would really appreciate that. Uh, you guys have been wonderful viewers. I will miss you all. But if you miss my music and you want to listen to some and support my music by purchasing it, I do have a Bandcamp site. Um, so it's called bandcamp.shellyong.com. Please go over there and purchase some music and gift the music if you wish to friends who might be interested in listening to my work. I hope to also start tracking my concerto uh, but I have some plans that will make this release quite different from my previous ones. Again technology has sped up uh, and uh, uh, made made a place in our lives that are offering many other ways of consuming music and owning music. So I'd really like to look into those. Uh, but I'll let you know again via notification alerts or the community posts on YouTube. And if you're my Facebook friend, you'll also be notified on Facebook. Alrighty. Uh, I wish you all uh, safe travels if you're traveling. Uh, stay safe if you're just staying at home. Uh, stay well. And I'll see you again very soon. Please again help me promote music and chat and my YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll see you very, very soon. Uh, take care till then. I will stay on uh, the stream for a while in case you have questions for me but bye